Thank you so much, Adi. Um, this was not a planned event. I mean, we did not plan it for a long time, a long time ago. Uh, I was supposed to actually be part of a webinar, and it just happened that I was traveling and I was coming to Malaysia anyway. So it was a fortunate, uh, you know, coincidence that uh, you know we could throw it together. Um, and not to not to disappoint, but I know that we have, uh, you know, the discussion that we had subsequently. We had it in the title that is going to be Salafism as an intellectual crisis. Um, however, I'm not going to speak so much about Salafism itself. Uh, I uh, I think it might be a little bit less contentious if we avoid labels. Uh, but I believe that there is a certain cultural current, if we don't want to call it a religious or social political current, uh, but a cultural current among Muslims today, which uh, prefers uh, direct instructions rather, and, and is very suspicious towards usage of human faculties such as reason or referring to your conscience or things like that. Uh, and I'm going to talk a, a lot more about that, but it seems to me that there is the search for a holy document that tells you exactly what to do in every context, uh, because we don't want to rely upon what we consider to be unreliable things such as human reason. Uh, I am a former Salafi myself. Uh, I used to be a Salafi for a while. I was radicalized into jihadi Salafism, in, in, in fact, for a period of three years. I have an intimate experience with radicalization and de-radicalization, but I also have this uh, you know, uh, I'm, I'm a curious person by, uh, you know, by nature. So during that phase when I was Salafi, I consumed a lot of Salafi material. Um, and I got a very, um, uh, you know, I got a pretty deep understanding of their own sources from, you know, as a believer at the time. Um, the talk itself will probably leave you with more questions than answers, but that is my intention. So we spoke about crisis of values, and I want to talk to you about a little bit about what I mean by that. Um, notice that some Muslims can be some of the kindest people on the planet, and the most generous, the most kind, the most compassionate people on the planet, and when you ask them why, they will say Islam inspires us. And some Muslims can be some of the vilest, most criminal, most bloodthirsty people on the planet, and when you ask them why, they will also say Islam inspires us. This is, of course, a strange situation to find ourselves in. We don't really uh, uh, agree on what it means to be Islamic. Um, and this crisis of value is compounded. I think it's like, uh, I, I actually wrote, a posted, posted a thread about it on Twitter about 2015. This was at the, at the height of uh, the ISIS crisis, you know? Um, so, I noticed that in response to ISIS, we had a much needed discussion about this topic of tradition, what it means, what, what Islamic tradition entails. Uh, but unfortunately, a lot of the discussion at the time was really over who speaks for Islam. So it was basically traditionalist Muslims saying that we are the ones who interpret Islam and these people are Khawarij. Meanwhile, ISIS will tell you that no, we, you know, we were, we're actually speaking, they, they claim the mainstream, even though they're not, of course. Um, so it was a tussle over tradition rather than a, spe a, uh, a conversation over values. Um, from there, I, uh, and I, I believe I was here in Malaysia when I was writing this. Uh, this I, I spent some time in Malaysia after my expulsion from my country before I managed to uh, uh, get asylum in Norway. Um, and there's a story behind this, but, even, but eventually I came to, the, to, to, the, to, uh, you know, to a certain belief that Islam or, is, or classical Islamic studies does not have a, a formal, explicit, and objective value system or a mechanism or a, a, a methodology to extract values. The, the main methodology that we have is actually fiqh, and fiqh is a way to extract rules and not values. Fiqh is a very, it's, a, it's actually a very mature, uh, uh, what do you say, uh, methodology, but the, the concept of fiqh, the, the, the end result of fiqh, is to come up with ahkam. Ahkam basically means rules. Um, and this is our dominant paradigm. I'm not saying, of course, that 
fiqh or Islamic studies, etc., are not concerned with values. They are, of course, concerned with values, and values are spoken about a lot. We talk about it in terms of tazkiyah, in terms of tarbiyah, in terms of you know, our own behavior. But when it comes to something which is objective and precise, uh, we're actually much better at coming up with rules. And this rules, this thinking of Islam in terms of rules, has become a sort of uh, a cultural phenomenon. It's not only... Uh, I would actually even call it epistemological in a sense that we access, we go into the Quran to look for rules. Uh, and when you go in looking for something, that's what you find. You, we go into the Quran looking for rules and that's why we find a lot of rules. Um, interestingly, of course, the fact is that the Quran does not have a lot of rules, even though you know it's, it's a very big book. Um, if you take, count it by the number of verses, it doesn't really, most of the verses are not actually rule-bearing verses or ayat ahkam. Um, so we end up basically with an Islam that tries to extract as many rules as possible, rather than speak about these are the core values from which we have to uh, proceed. Um, so Islamic scholarship classically has been focused, uh, you know, if you want to be a scholar, and this is a, of course because of historical reasons that we can, we, we can come back to, uh, but the division of power in Muslim polities, in Muslim states, was basically divided between people who make the rules, which were the fuqaha, the scholarly establishment, and people who uh, you know, have, the, have the ultimate political power in the end, which is the ruler. Um, and this, of course, this separation of power, this kind of archaic separ separation of powers was actually better than, let's say, medieval-style European tyranny, or you know monarchy where you know actually the the, the, the king had all the power he, did, he he made the rules and he uh, you know and he had the political power um, so in a sense it was better than the alternative at the time but it wasn't we can't exactly say that it is um, uh, in the modern sense of the word uh, an actual separation of power especially you know what, seeing what happened eventually with Islamic scholarship. I was hoping at the time, when I was actually thinking about this issue, and as I said, there was, like a, there was a personal story behind it because I was uh, in a position where I had to take certain decisions uh, that affect not only my life, but the life of my family and the life of others. And I was kind of disappointed because when I actually sought some uh, guidance among uh, some Islamic figures that I respected, there wasn't, it was very, very, very uh, uh, clear that there is no real, uh, I mean, there is no way to make certain kinds of value judgments. There is no objective way to make value judgments, basically a personal call. Um, and I was hoping at the time, when I saw that ISIS was actually pushing us to reinterpret a lot of our own practices to look after ourselves, and especially the fact that ISIS uh, even though, of course, there, it is way, it's a fringe movement, if you look at Islamic history or Islamic tradition, uh, but they share some of, the, uh, of their basic assumptions or epistemological assumptions, some of them, not all of them, for, for sure, uh, unfortunately, with mainstream Islam, which is why it was so difficult to uh, de-radicalize ISIS members by referring only to the tradition. You normally have to refer to other things other than the tradition to speak to them. So I was hoping that ISIS was forcing us to look at ourselves in a way where we're actually moving uh, beyond uh, you know, a, rule, a rules-based Islam towards a values-based Islam. But I want to speak a little bit about what it means what do we mean by value, first of all? Value basically means a conception of the good. When you say the word good, it's very difficult to define. You can't actually define the word good because for the reason, the reason being, the concept of goodness, the concept of, of value or quality is actually closer to us than our own language. So if you actually take a word, so for example, let's say that you, say, you want to say that something is uh, is tasty, for example. We're talking about taste. You say it tastes good, so you're using the word good again. And when you say, what does it mean to taste good? You say it's pleasing, so you're actually, again, referring to pleasing. What does it mean to, to be pleasing? It makes you feel good. It's a circular definition. You can't actually completely, def completely define what it means for something to be good. What this, this is very, very important. This, this seems like it's counterintuitive. Sorry, it's, uh, that is completely intuitive, but it's actually important for the reason that 
for us to define good, we, all, we have to always refer to our own senses. The human being is at the center of any conversation of, about good. For that reason, if we, remove, if we want to remove the human being from the formula, if we want to remove the human being and basically create a, a, a system whereby uh, we can define good without the reference of the human being, uh, what happens is that we're actually going to create a whole bunch of rules uh, and we're going to uh, create a tradition rather than a set of values and principles. And I'm going to, like, I'm going to uh, try to explain that a little bit more. Um, but before that, I mean, note the fact that in our own religious discourse today, when we want to say something is a good action, what do we call it? What do we call it? The, the, the word which is most commonly used in Arabic is ta'a. I don't know if it's the same in Malaysia. But in the Arabic language, in most of, uh, like if, if, if I go right now and look at most lectures, most Friday sermons, uh, books, etc., the word, the duality is ta'a and masiyah. Ta'a means, literally, it means obedience. Masiyah means disobedience. Uh, keep in mind, of course, when I give you a rule, there is only one way for you to interact with the rule. You either obey it or disobey it. If we go to the Quran, on the other hand, we see that the Quran does not actually emphasize obedience uh, as this vector of value. The Quran actually uses, I mean, a friend of mine called, uh, his name is Ismail Kuran, who writes, he's, he's an academic, Turkish academic, um, who writes on this, you know, he's currently researching this, uh, this, this question, and he was asking himself, why didn't Muslim philosophers develop a theory of morality such as that of Immanuel Kant, for example, or you know the Enlightenment professors. Um, and the fact, is because, the fact is that they, it's true that they did not, but it's not that it's impossible within the Islamic paradigm because the Quran actually uses certain words uh, which, which should really make us think. When the Quran talks about good, one vector is Hassan and Sayyid. And this is all over the Quran. You can pick up the Quran. You don't have to take my word for it. You can pick up the Quran and look for it. Hassan literally means beautiful in, Arab, in Arabic. And Sayyid means, you know, the opposite of that. Uh, the word beautiful, again, refers to the human being. For, for you to actually judge something as beautiful or not, you have to be at the center of that. Another word which is used, or another vector, is actually Sayyid, sorry, uh, is Ma'roof and Munkar. Ma'roof, uh, and of course this is, again, repeated many times in the Quran, Ma'roof actually means Literally in Arabic, it means well-known. Well-known as in widely acknowledged among all people to be good. Munkar, on the other hand, is exactly the opposite. Something which is widely acknowledged to be bad. Um, another vector is tayyib and khabith. Tayyib, again, literally means good. Khabith is quite the opposite. Uh, khabith actually has this, uh, this meaning of being insidious or malicious or harmful even. The fourth vector used by the Quran, and I'm, I'm, in no way am I saying that they are the only vectors, but they are the main vectors that, that I, uh, I noticed, is salih and batil. Salih means useful, something which works, something that actually has benefit or beneficial versus batil. So these are all the vectors presented in the Quran, but when it comes to our own religious discourse, we say ta'a and masiyah. And this should make us think because words are not only words, they're actually a window to the way that we think. We think in terms of ta'a and masiyah. We think in terms of rules. And that's why when we go into the Quran, all we find is rules. Um, so the thing is, as I said, rules or hukum or ahkam, there, is not, there, is, there isn't much you can actually interact with it because it is not dependent upon your, when, when I give you an order, it is not actually dependent upon your own uh, sense of the goodness of this deed. You have to either follow on, on, or, or disobey. This is what you can do. This is how you can interact with the hukum. This actually removes your own agency. It removes your own intellect out of the picture because in the end, the intellect is actually invested in the person who's coming up with the rules. Who's coming up with the rules? our own clerical establishment. It is our clerical establishment that basically decides, uh, you know, the, the fuqaha, 
uh, this has classically been the case, and you know, in many, many countries it continues to be the case, that they are the ones who are empowered with making the decision and coming up with these rules. Um, in a sense, we are not citizens in our religion. We are subjects. What I mean by subjects is that we are expected to follow. We are not interacting with, uh, when, we, when, we, when, we, when we take the Quran, we're, we're more than welcome to interact with the Quran in a way that uh, enhances our taqwa, enhances our iman, enhances our faith. But when it comes to actually taking action, avoiding something or doing something, again, it's, it's, it, it, it comes down to a matter of rules, following rules. Um, so the thing is, traditional Islam, and I think a lot of the things, I'm not going to be referring to, to labels a lot. Uh, it's interesting to speak about certain ideological and, and uh, you know, uh, schools of thought in Islamic history in terms of their historical development. And this is a passion of mine. I like, uh, you know, I really enjoy uh, reading Islamic history, uh, especially early history, you know, the, the, the period in which the Aqaid and the, the, the schools of fiqh were developed because you can look at the, the political context around it and you can see that uh, in many cases, uh, politics played a role in, in the reason why we did one thing or we, to we took one decision rather than the other or we took one direction rather than the other. But there is a certain, you could pro probably classify um, uh, traditional Islamic attitude towards human intellect as three different schools. And this is uh, a factor in Aqidah or one of the, the, the the subjects of Aqidah, or subtopics of Aqidah called at tahseen wa taqbih Tahseen means uh, what do you consider, how do you decide that something is a good action or a bad action? And there are two schools of thought here. There is a tahseen al-aqli and a tahseen, sorry, a tahseen wa taqbih al-aqli and a tahseen wa taqbih al-shari. Al-aqli, aql means intellect. At-Taqbih wa tahsin al-Aqli was taken by certain uh, Islamic uh, schools, most notably the Mu'tazila, and they considered that it is up to the human intellect to decide. As In other words, the human intellect is capable of deciding whether something is good or bad. The other side was at tahsin wa taqbih al-Shari, which, uh, you know, on the extreme side, uh, if we say the Salafi, the Athari school, traditionally, was that the human intellect is not capable on its own to, to say what is good and what is bad, and we need revelation for that. The only source that can tell us whether an action is good or bad is revelation. There has been a middle position throughout Islamic history. Why? Because the, the extreme position which says that the human intellect is incapable, incapable of, do, of knowing right for, from wrong, is not tenable. It's not actually a, a common sense position because we know that even even animals have some compassion. We know that even uh, you know subhuman species are able to know what is good and bad, at least you know in the context of their own you know their own uh, you know awareness. So a middle position was reached, uh, especially by the Ashari's, and they uh, the middle position was that you can always use your intellect for anything beyond revelation. Which means that the question became, if revelation talks about something, then you're not allowed to use your intellect in that particular, uh, to judge whether it's good or bad, you have to follow. Uh, this has been the historical uh, picture, and we know that historically the Mu'tazila school, or the rationalist school of uh, Islamic uh, thought was uh, you know, expulged from history. Uh, they were defeated uh, culturally and defeated politically, and uh, the pretty much there are still Mu'tazilis today, but the tradition has been broken. Um, so the idea here is that traditional Islamic thought, traditional or let's say traditionist Islamic thought, even today has a certain attitude of, uh, of uh, suspicion towards human intellect. Part of the problem with this, I mean, part of the problem with uh, figuring out a place for human intellect in, uh, you know, in our religious life 
is that there is this cer certain confusion about two different concepts. There is the concept of something being objective versus subjective, and there's a concept of something being relative uh, or absolute. And this, is, this might get a little bit complex, so you know, I'm going to, maybe I'll stop after this. It gets a little bit complex, but you know, it takes a little bit of concentration. For many people, they're resisting, they resist uh, the idea of saying that, you know what, this particular rule or this particular value or this particular verse, I'm going to implement it in my life in this particular way. Um, of course, the lot of, uh, the, because of the suspicion when it comes to using your human intellect beyond rules, uh, and because of this, as I, what, what I describe as an obsession with rules, uh, it's almost as if when we talk about taking a certain concept and making it relative, we're also making it um, subjective. So let me first of all explain the difference between the two. When I say that something is objective versus something is subjective, objective means it's not, it's not up to me. It's not up to me. Uh, when I say, for example, that the, uh, if someone, for example, gives me some water, and I say that this water is hot, uh, I would say that it is hot if anybody try, tries it, he will, he will agree that it's hot. Or if everybody looks at it, it will say, yeah, this is water. You know? So it's not subjective, it's not up to my whim to say that this is, uh, that this is water or this is hot or this is clear, etc. The matter of subjective and objective, the matter of uh, relative and absolute is actually more of if I am using it to drink, then I want it to be very cold. Then relative to my own usage of it, I want it to be cold, this is good. If I want it to shower, then I don't want it to be that cold. So in a sense, um, giving an, another example, let's say for example, we're, we're presented, each of us is presented with a lemon and we're, we want to say, is this sour or not? Is the taste of the lemon sour or not? I think objectively we're going to, to agree that yeah, it is sour because you know, most, of, most people, if, you're, if, you know, if you have a tongue like every other human being, then yeah, you're going to say that this is objectively, it's not up to you, it's not subjective, it's not a subjective statement to say, this lemon is sour. But do you like it or not? Well, that is relative to you. In a similar sense, when we take that concept and apply it to morality, a lot of the people think that if we make it relative, then it becomes what stops being objective. A good way of me, like a good way to explain it is, when I, if I speak on uh, to 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 Ali, and I want to say Ali is sitting to my left hand side, that is objectively true. But it's also relative to me because if I face that way, he'll be on my right hand side. If I face this way, he's going to be behind me. So his position to me is relative, but also objective. This is the way that I speak about morality. Morality is both objective and it is relative. It is not absolute, because if it is absolute, then that means that uh, it's going to keep, if it's, if it's going to be absolute, that means it's not, we're not going to uh, account for uh, individual uh, you know, choices or individual contexts, individual positions. What I'm trying to say is that it is always possible to know good from evil. The human intellect can always recognize it. However, what, uh, you know, the, the, the particular context that you're in will always change that. Sometimes the same action is moral in some position and it's immoral in another position. Um, how are we doing on time? Well, now we can take a quick discussion. Okay, so I'm just going to close at this point. Note how when we speak about, in, in our own language, when it comes to Islamic language, we, we talk about halal and haram. We talk about permissible and impermissible. This is not always the same. This is not the same word as permissible and impermissible is not the same word as good as bad. But this is how we use it. Keep in mind that the Quran has, how many verses does the Quran has? 6,236 verses. How many verses of the Quran are rule-bearing verses? The ayat ahkam. Different, uh, you know, different schools of uh, fiqh give you different answers, but the maximum will give you 500. 
normally it's around 120 to 150 verses. Out of 6,236 verses, around 100 or 150 verses have rules. Which means that the majority of the Quran, I don't know if you have a calculator, you can calculate how much percent of that. But the majority of the Quran is not rules. But because we have these rules, we have to keep, you know, because we have a rules-based view of the Quran, of, the, of, of our religion, we, we need rules. You know, because we have to fill in the blanks, because the Quran has, you know, 150, 150 verses, that means it's not going to cover everything. So in that, for that reason, for us to actually create more rules, we need to add more sources. So we need hadith, and the hadith corpus keeps expanding, or kept expanding uh, historically. And beyond that, we have to add the ijma' and the qiyas of the, of the scholars. And beyond that, we have to add a lot of scholarship to the point that someone recently, and a, someone who is a traditional uh, Muslim student, put together a statistics where he actually went through one of the fiqh books of the, the basically sharia books and he wanted to see how many of the rules of sharia are directly divine they're coming directly from the quran or from the prophet and astoundingly I, and i did not check his result but astoundingly he said i found that 94 percent of all of those rules do not come from the quran or the sunnah they're actually coming from the Qiyas, they're coming from historical precedent, they're coming from Ijma' or they're coming from the opinions of, the, the collected opinions of the scholars. So, I'll give a little bit of a summary over here and then we'll close and have a little bit of question and answers. The effects of a rule-based religion or tradition, in my opinion, is number one, it becomes increasingly complex because when you're keeping track of a lot of rules, the complexity will increase. Um, and I have a good you know, story about that, but maybe, maybe a little bit later. Because it becomes complex, you need a specialized class of people to take care of it, which is, means that we, have, we need a clerical class. And again, you know that Islam traditionally was anti-clerical. And the, the Prophet وسلم, did not establish a, a, an orthodoxy or a clerical class, but eventually we did have one. As the clerical establishment collects more power, because of you know, the respect of the community, it becomes a political player. Um, and be, when it becomes a political player, it starts to act as a political player. In other words, it becomes concerned with its own continuation. Uh, the constant search of rules means that we will inflate the non-Quranic sources because we need rules for everything. Um, and the emphasis on tradition, because once we start emphasizing tradition, we have a past-facing faith rather than a future-facing faith. And this becomes very much entrenched in our culture as well. So we'll stop here. I think, uh, I hope that we're keeping good time. And we'll take a little bit of, uh, you know, discussion on these points and then we'll come back to the next section. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Um, I think very important claims uh, in your initial uh, section. Um, and I'm sure our participants would have some, co some questions on that. But just a clarification uh, question from my side. And, and that is that um, during the talk, you also, you, when you refer to Salafism, uh, although I'll, I'll appreciate uh, that you know, you're not talking about labeling, yeah. but I think for the definitional purpose, if you could just lay it out like, a, you know, how would you define it? Uh, because you also said yeah, you were also at time. So yeah. how would you differentiate your thought process as a Salafi versus I believe you're not? And so what is the difference? Uh, and that, that, that's one point. This is more of clarification. Mm. Um, and secondly, you, you mentioned that uh, that ISIS uh, share several or many epistemological assumptions with the mainstream. Also, this was also very intriguing. Uh, maybe clarification on that, and then we will continue with uh, some inputs from the. Well, about uh, the reason why I prefer not to speak in terms of labels is because some of the words, I might be using a word in, some, in a certain way, and someone else might be using it in a very different way. So it's good to unpack, so, so it's good to unpack what, what we mean. And Salafism, unfortunately, uh, historically, we, we talked about the Aqaid as three different blocks. We talked about the Ash'ari as the middle position. We talked about the Mu'tazili as being the rationalist school and the Salafi school as being the most literalist. Um, but that's in terms of aqidah, not in, so in terms of fiqh. Uh, aqidah, of course, is what we believe, fiqh is what we do. 
it's the practice. So basically, the practical applications, or as as I mentioned, the rules. Uh, the issue uh, that that we face in this in this case is that Salafism has become a cultural phenomenon in in this day and age, uh, and the meaning of the word has shifted over the 20th century coming to the 21st century, which is why I'm very reluctant to say this is Salafism, rather than, and that's why I prefer to say these are certain cultural and I would even say epistemological in a sense that, you know, this is how we access certain religious knowledge. Uh, and that's why I would, you know, I'm not avoiding the question, I just prefer not to focus too much on, uh, on the labels. Um, as for your question about ISIS, um, it's an interesting, it's interesting to, it's an interesting question to see. But I think I have some some material later Thank on you. about that, we'll so so we'll come to that. Yeah. You, sorry, I firstly my name is Sabiha. Um, I apologize for my tardiness. I arrived sort of like towards the end of your talk, um, but what I sort of picked up in the last sort of ten minutes, and I think it sort of encompassed for me what your talk is about today, which was that we've become a past facing faith. And to me, so the question for me to you is, is that how do we then, as a religion, become a future-facing community? So it would be the third part of the talk. Ah, so, okay. yeah. so we'll come back to yeah, that. So we'll come back but to that. Any, any clarification? But any like clarification about what we, what we already discussed, let's say, or any reactions? Otherwise, we can move on. <laughs> 